could have just gone, you know. Summer Sundays with the Davis Sisters. Wait. Hey. Um, okay. Y- yeah, um, so, um, wait a sec. Where are we? Welcome to... Yeah, welcome um, to... No. Um... Victoria Awkward and I'm the director of VLA Dance and today we're gonna slow down to warm up. So get your right hand and place it on your heart and your left hand on your belly. You can close your eyes or look at the scenery behind me and we're gonna breathe in for five, breathe in and out for five times. In and out. In Researching a new work with mechanical engineer Dr. Benjamin Linder and our creative team Victoria Awkward, Harrison Burke, Dewey DeLay, Frederick Moss, and Whitney Schmansky. In the realm of sustainable design, we've been prototyping these wooden boxes that operate as both characters and landscapes exploring embodied questions around our accountability for and to innovation. We have been building a sort of physical language with these figures, probing the possibilities of form and curiosities of function between them. We're 
were constructing, deconstructing, and reconstructing physical and emotional states to consider what's in our control. I invite you to join in on our team's research at home. First, take a closer look around your home, no matter if it's on your dining room table, kitchen counter, under your bed, or Davis sister style in your junk drawer. What's drawing your attention? Choose something mundane, perhaps something that's lost meeting or oomph in the last five months. Not a clever competition. Stay true to your instincts and remain open to the possibility that it can really be anything. Ask yourself, what can it do? What can't it do? And what do you want it to do? How can you transform and thus animate this inanimate object? How is it at once a character in your home and a part of your domestic landscape? What are this object's least interesting features and most unique behaviors, and how can you re-enchant them? What physical dialogue can you have together and only together?
Annette. <coughs> Annette. I know when we were in high school, you got into the occult. Now, have you put a hex on me ever since I saw that dead plant of yours? I just thought, oh no, I hope Annette doesn't try one of her witchy experiments on me. I have a summer cold. <laughs> this hasn't happened to me in ages. I don't know. And it's just that plus Annette, this. How do I do that thing where I turn it around? This. Look at these poor sunflowers. Now they were just bursting with life before. And look at this. Just look at it. Deadhead. 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 All over the place. I just don't even know. I've even put, see those little balls? I put fertilizer. But I will say, I love this scarf you made me back in 94. Oh, honey, that was a good year, wasn't it? Oh, I'm, I'm not mad at you. I just wish that you would lift this veil. Oh, just, I don't know. Send me to some of that big stock of NyQuil that you have, okay? Earth to Boston. The Davis Sisters here with some community news. Hi, everyone. This is Freedom Baird. I'm an interdisciplinary artist based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the Instructions Vault, which is an installation that was installed in the Mills Gallery at the Boston Center for the Arts in the winter of 2020. People who enter the vault will be able to reflect and write down instructions, and then those instructions will be carefully saved and per preserved for a time in the future when they can then be referenced, when they're needed, when there's some crisis happening. And what ended up being so remarkable that, about the Instructions Vault that none of us could have anticipated as the show was going up is that those instructions ended up being needed way sooner than any of us could have ever dreamed they would be. Um, it was incredibly moving to see people uh, at the opening and then on other visits I made to the gallery um, to see people step into the space and take some time to really think about what they would tell someone in the future to do, how to live, how to be. I gave them a prompt to kind of write a specific instruction for a specific person in a specific role, you know, confronting some specific problem. So I was expecting these very explicit, specific instructions, but people um, threw that prompt a little bit out the window, which is great. Uh, and instead, they ended up writing uh, more general, very impassioned instructions that ended up being almost like commandments or sometimes like pleas or like prayers. Um, so all of that got stored in the vault on these saffron colored leaflets of paper. And then the other wild, bizarre, tragic thing that ended up happening, of course, is with the shutdown that that space actually became a vault for a while. Um, nobody could go into the gallery. Uh, and visit and participate in any of and you know enjoy any of the work that was up during the show and Another kind of piece of that is that I myself got sick with COVID-19 uh, Starting sometime in March. So that's you know, that's kind of how it played out and it's very moving and chilling to go through the instructions that people wrote back in February and to realize that we need to act on them today.
Oh, Helen, you're always overreacting to my involvement with the magical side of knitting. I mean, we all know that the fiber arts can have a lot in common with the mystical arts of witchcraft. I mean, look, a knitting needle's basically a, a wand, and I like to use it as such. But no, I, I, had nothing, I had nothing to do with your plants dying. I'm very sorry that that happened. Um, maybe they need more water? Okay, I need to, I need to blow these out before my husband gets home. He doesn't like when I use the lighter without him. He gets very nervous, so. All right, okay. Uh, you look good, Helen. You look great. That scarf, it's very, very nice. It's like how fashion is cyclical. Okay. Hi, welcome in Michael Strom now to Dinner with Key. Michael and I go way back. We started dancing together at Dallas Black, would you say? Yeah, yeah. At Dallas Black Dance Theater. We went to Booker T. Washington High School for performing in visual arts. We danced there. Michael was also in the repertory company at Booker T. Washington High School. So you would rush over from Booker T. All the time. To our Dallas Black Dance Theater rehearsals. Yep. You would start your day at, what, like 8 a.m.? 8 a.m. And then you would end your day at 10.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. Dance non stop. Dance non stop. With a few AP chemistry, biology <laughs> classes, uh, English, English, yeah. English too, whatever. Like, wow. I was like, it's definitely a moment in time, I think, like doing that stuff, like getting that, having to do academics, doing all of my dance classes at Liberty, rehearsing at Liberty. And then running over to Dallas Black to catch the rehearsals there, I was like always kind of like, I feel like I was like in this in-between space in my life. Right. Like I could never just like settle in on one thing. Like I always had to be on. Like I was like, I'm here and now I'm there. Like, right. It was never like a moment of like, oh, like I can kind of like sit back on it. Like I had to always kind of be five steps ahead. Right. I either was going to be five steps ahead or I was going to be ten steps behind. So right. It's like always like this game of like how much more on top of this can I be? And it was, I mean, it was fun and I was young so I could do it. Like I had the energy for it. Right. And then, But like thinking back on it now, I was like, that is actually crazy. Like, That's crazy. All, all and that. as your friend, I knew that dance wasn't your whole life. Yeah. Like it wasn't your world. Right. But it dictated so much of like what you were or were becoming. Right. And what you were doing. Right. Do you feel like all of that work has really paid off? Yeah, I think the the lesson actually came in the like the work, like not just dancing in and of itself, but the the discipline that it takes to show up on time, to be prepared, mm -hmm. to try to get ahead, to you know, even simple things of like getting all of my schoolwork done mm -hmm. at school because I knew I had seven hours of dance after my English class. Right. So it, I think the lessons, I mean, there were, of course, things that I learned dance-wise along the way and things about the art form mm -hmm. itself, but the lessons were actually, like, the small little things of, like, oh, being responsible is actually more than just knowing my five, six, seven. Right. Like, being responsible means I have to learn how to manage my time. Right. I have to learn how to set aside the right amount of time for everything in my life, whether that's dance, that's family, that's homework, that's, like, whatever it was in that situation, I had to really learn how to, okay, take ownership of it and not let that slow me down and be like, okay, this is what I'm being faced with right now. This is how we have to deal with it because I actually have to. Like, right. it wasn't like you know, like back in when we were dancing for Dallas, like, like there wasn't that choice of like, oh, I think I'm going to do this today. So, right. No, like this is what we were on have to schedule. Do today. Yeah. And we and we just did it because you know, I mean, what we were passionate about it, but we knew like this is the work that we had to do. Right. So that I mean, it was fun though. I mean, as as much of a of a tiring 
um, experience it could have been at times. I think mean, that the the results and the benefits that we gained out of it were actually a lot more um, crucial to our our development as artists. I feel you. As, as our development as just like people and like finding and figuring out who we are. Right. Um, I feel like that took precedence more over than just getting the dance steps, which is like getting like my leg up or, you know, like I right. really had the opportunity to kind of figure out who am I in this space, you know? Right. I can say that after going through four years at Juilliard in even, you know, being fresh at Boston Valley right now, it's like, I'm starting to realize, like, the, the small detail, the small details that I had tried to forget about, about myself, that I'm actually telling myself to hold on to those things, mm-hmm. because they will make sense at some point. Right. Like, those are going to be the things that separate me from everyone else that's still on the same path. Because I'm like, I mean, how boring is it to be in a space where everyone's exactly the same, everyone right. moves exactly the same, but there's no sense of uniqueness or right. individuality. So I, I, I just tell myself every day when I walk into the studio, oh, just hold on to that that small detail that you want to forget about yourself. Mm-hmm. Just hold on to it. Because yeah. it actually will be something that will, for one reason or another, come back around and be to your benefit. Like when right. a choreographer comes in or a director comes in, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm seeing... 50 dancers in front of me, but you right there, there, there's something going on here. I don't necessarily understand it. Right. It's maybe not exactly what I originally asked for, but something's different. And, and right. I think that that's, that's nothing, that's not something we should shy away from as artists or as African Americans in predominantly white spaces or, or people that are just, just different minded in mm-hmm. general. Like, just really embracing and accepting, okay, maybe I do, to a certain extent, have to fit into a certain mold. I mean, I feel like we all kind of have to do it. Like, if you're in a certain space, you, you know what's kind of appropriate in that yeah. space. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're confined to just that one school of thought. Like, there are so many other influences that you can use and pull from right. to actually still make you a part of that environment. But, uh, but an individual is like, thank you for having, uh, yeah, for joining me. Um, I'm like, I always come for the food. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is how I food, kind of like trick my friends into conversation. Come, having a conversation with me about art because we don't like to always talk about these things, but I'm personally interested in creative processes and all the yeah. work that goes be- like behind the scenes, yeah. the research, right. the questioning, right. all of those things yeah. are as important as the final product. Right. Movement That's is right. research. Right. Movement is research. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Boo. Of course. <laughs>
There is power in creativity. There is strength in reimagining. My name is Allison Maria Rodriguez, and I'm a first-generation Cuban-American interdisciplinary artist based in Boston. I work predominantly in video installation, and thematically, I tend to focus on climate change, species extinction, and the interconnectivity of existence. Subversive Dreams at Emerson Contemporary features work from the ongoing Legends Breathe series, a project that I began a few years ago that is based on interviews with different female-identified and non-binary artists and creatives about childhood fantasies that assisted them in overcoming trauma. In one-on-one -on -one conversations, the artist describes their fantasy to me in as much visual detail as possible, and I then explore that conversation through an assortment of mediums and techniques, such as green screen video, on-location video, drawing, digitally generated imagery, photography performance, sculpture collage, to create individual animations. These animations are usually created with the intention of exhibiting them collectively, so they are then in conversation with each other as well. Together, they speak to a formidable strategy of survival activated through the power of creativity, and they invoke the imaginary, a force that is embraced in youth but suppressed in adulthood. This exhibition, Subversive Dreams, reclaims the concept of fantasy as a tool of empowerment for social change, not as a method of escapism. Declared worthless in a capitalist society centered around white patriarchal notions of productivity, fantasy and play are the building blocks in creating something new. They are exercises in resistance and in the possibility of reimagining our world. This world needs systemic innovation, and Subversive Dreams is about embracing the idea of alternative forms of knowledge. In childhood, as in dreams, folks tend to be more open to the magical, to thinking beyond what is seen and what is culturally recognized as real, and thereby also beyond the structural paradigms that have been ingrained in our society. There's simply more openness to different ways of knowing, understanding, and experiencing existence. I would also parallel this alternative form of knowing to a profound wisdom embedded in nature. I like the word intimacy in relation to my work. In general, I always return to discovering or exploring truly intimate methods for approaching a conversation about environmentalism. And the work in this exhibition operates at the intersection of environmental and social justice. It illustrates a harvesting of strength and transcendence through a deep connection to the natural world and conveys a link between the trauma and healing of our planet to that of the individual. Ultimately, Subversive Dreams emphasizes the interconnection of existence and celebrates the power of the imagination and its crucial role in the process of actualizing new ways of being.
chain. <laughs> favorite songs of, of Fred Rogers. So uh It's you I like It's not the things you wear It's not the way you do your hair But it's you I like The way you are right now The way deep down inside you Not the things that hide you Like your sweater, your fractals they're just beside you Oh, it's you I like Every part of you Your skin, your eyes, your feelings Whether old or new I hope that you'll remember Even when you're feeling blue That it's you I like it's you yourself, it's you, oh, it's you, I like. ship. There it is. It takes time. It takes practice. But one day, I'm going to get there. It's going to sound really good. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram, you can do so at Rob Flax. It's spelled like that little thing that shows up on the Zoom box or wherever you're watching this. You can also follow me on YouTube.com slash Rob Flax Music. And if you'd like to really support me and help fund my art so that I can buy more unnecessary, I mean really lovely synthesizers, check out patreon.com slash Rob Flax, where you can sign up to support my music for as low as $1 a month.
personal in their world. That was when you two got into a fight on the ferry because you have different needs in the morning. Remember, 